Hello everybody, uh, we're looking at John chapter 11. We're actually gonna break this into four uh, different uh, talks on John chapter 11. This is one of the most famous uh, miracles that we see actually in the New Testament performed by Jesus where he raises Lazarus from the dead after four days of being, uh, being dead. And um, it's interesting that this is, uh, this particular miracle is not recorded in the other three gospels. John is the only uh, gospel writer who includes this particular miracle. And there's a lot of uh, speculation as to why. One probably that makes the most sense is that the other three gospels were uh, based pretty significantly on the testimony of Peter. Uh, and Peter wasn't at this, uh, this particular miracle. He was not there. The other, uh, several of the other disciples were there, but not, uh, but not Peter. And so because of that, the other gospel writers didn't choose to, to include it uh, because they didn't have the testimony of Peter. But John was there, and so John obviously includes this very significant miracle in his, um, in his testimony about Jesus. And, and so in John chapter 11, it, uh, it starts out uh, where Jesus is not, uh, he's not anywhere near where uh, um, Lazarus and his two sisters are. Uh, the message is actually sent to him. It talks about uh, it talks about Jesus and the need for his presence. Uh, Mary and Martha were looking for his presence to be there so that uh, Lazarus could be healed and protected and taken care of. Him. When I think about um, community or I think about presence, it reminds me of a story of a pastor who uh, he he loved playing golf but can never play on Sundays because obviously a pastor's big responsibility is to be at church on Sunday and provide leadership and teaching and, um, you know, and all of that. So anyhow, he woke up one Sunday morning and, and the weather was beautiful and I mean, it was perfect. And he had been wanting to play golf so badly. And so he decided he was going to fake sick and ditch church. So he, he, uh, he called his associate pastor and said, listen, I, I woke up sick this morning. Uh, I can't, uh, I can't make it. Will you cover for me? I'll send you my notes. And, uh, and of course the associate pastor is like, well, I, yeah, I, if you're sick, I'll, I'll do whatever I have to do. So the, uh, the pastor got up, went, got ready and went and played, uh, a round of golf and he was doing it. Of course he's by himself because he doesn't want anybody to know he's playing golf. So he's by himself playing golf and he gets to uh, the second hole, and uh, of course, God's noticing all of this, and he's got some angels around them, and they're watching this pastor play hooky from church and uh, lie about being sick and playing golf, and he gets to the second hole, it's a par four, and one of the angels turns to God and said, what are you gonna do? I mean, uh, here's this guy, he's supposed to be your servant, and he's really, and he's really doing the wrong thing here, and God says, well, you just watch. I got this all under control. So uh, on the second hole, it's a par four. Uh, the pastor gets up and hits the most beautiful drive he's ever hit in his life. And uh, God takes the ball, God manipulates it. Uh, the ball goes further than, than it uh, should have gone and actually rolls up on the green and falls in the hole. So it, a hole in one on a par four. I mean, it's an amazing shot. Even the pros don't hit things like this. And, the pastor was so excited, he was, couldn't believe it. He runs all the way down the fairway and gets to the, to the green. And one of the angels looks at God and said, hey God, what are you doing here? What? I, I can't believe that you actually rewarded him for, uh, you know, for ditching church and lying about being sick. And God said, I, I'm not rewarding him. Who can he tell? So that's the thing, right? I mean, uh, what makes life valuable, what makes uh, life exciting and comforting and everything is that we can actually have a relationship or communion with other people. And uh, that's really part of what this portion of scripture is all about. It's about the presence of the Lord, about being connected and related, not just to Jesus, but to his people. In John, um, or not in John, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. I just got that all messed up. I flipped it, a little dyslexia. In uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, basically Jesus says this. He gives, it's one of his last things that he says to his disciples. He tells them to go and it's the great commission. And, but then he does this, 
this really wonderful thing at the end and he says uh, in verse uh, 20 he says and lo I am with you even to the ends of the age he says I'm always going to be with you by the presence of the Holy Spirit I'm always going to be there and so we're looking today and we'll look for in the next few weeks the difference that the uh, that the presence of Jesus makes in our life so if you have your Bibles you can turn to John chapter 11 it says now a man named Lazarus was sick he was from Bethany the village of Mary and her sister Martha now Bethany that word uh, that word actually means uh, house of the poor so this was not a it was actually we know it was not a large community it was a small community and uh, it was a poor community. It was not well, uh, well known. It was on the way. It was a pass through on the way to Jerusalem for those who were going to the major festivals. Uh, it says the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And then um, John gives us an indication of who he's talking about. This actually didn't happen yet. Uh, uh, this, what what he illustrates, what Mary does, how he identifies Mary, actually comes to play in uh, John chapter 12. He says, this Mary, whose brother Lazarus uh, now lay sick, was the one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with, with her hair. He's trying to help us understand that Mary had a very close, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus, along with uh, Martha and Lazarus, that there was a lot of love between them all. Verse three, so the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. So they, um, they sent word to where Jesus was, which is about a day's travel. Uh, so this was significant. They, I mean, this was serious. They knew that something significant was going on. So they sent uh, a messenger uh, a day's travel uh, to Jesus to say, hey, Lazarus, and they identified the one you love is sick. Verse four, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. We know that this, this particular miracle actually sets in motion uh, where the, the Pharisees decide that they are going to kill Jesus. They, because of this miracle, it was so significant that people started following Jesus because of this particular miracle. Um, this started getting, uh, getting the ball rolling in a very big way, especially in Jerusalem. Uh, because this is near where the miracle happened was near Jerusalem. So when Jesus is saying this, he's actually speaking not just about uh, the glory that God would get the glory for, uh, you know, Jesus performing this miracle, but that it would set in motion the ultimate glory, which was the cross, the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Verse 5 says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So here's the here's what I think we need to understand when it comes to uh, when it comes to really understanding the presence of Jesus and why Jesus shows up why does Jesus you know give us his presence here's what I see in, in this is that Jesus was not driven by the crisis he wasn't driven by the crisis but instead he was moved by love he wasn't driven by the crisis it wasn't like oh, I gotta be there because there's a crisis I need a show up my presence needs to be there because of the crisis no his presence was motivated by love and so uh, uh in you know this this first five verses we see the love of christ um the love of jesus connected to mary martha and lazarus and their love for him so jesus presence wasn't motivated by the crisis it was motivated by what well, by his love and commitment to um to mary martha and Lazarus. Now, um, why is that important? I think it's important for this reason, because uh, if Jesus' presence is only motivated by, well, by um, crisis, then the only time we could really expect Jesus to show up in our life is when we're going through something that's a big deal. Instead, we need to understand that Jesus is present in our life. He's there for us because he loves us. Because we love him, he loves us. And his presence is consistent. It's not moved by crisis, it's moved out of his love for you and I. I like, I like that, I, I like the fact that it, it's consistent because God always loves us. 
Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, it says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And Jesus is consistent in his love for us. The story goes on in verse 6. It says, so. Now that word so is important. So he just heard that his friend uh, Lazarus was sick. Sick to the point of of death. That's why they sent a messenger a day's walk uh, to Jesus. This was a, a pretty significant moment. They sent for Jesus because they felt like if Jesus would just be there, that he, uh, Lazarus, would not die. And this is what Jesus said. This is Jesus' response. This is why we know that he wasn't motivated by the crisis. It says, verse 6, So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed there two more days. So he just found out that his friend uh, is sick to the point of death. And Jesus, being God in the flesh, could certainly solve that problem. What does Jesus do? He stays two more days. He delays leaving where he's at. Maybe because there were so many people that were coming to faith in Jesus. He had more work to do there. Uh, and so he, he didn't want to walk away from, from that. And plus he knew, he knew what the end result was going to be. Verse 7, And then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. So he said, Okay, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're going to stay a couple more days, and then we're going to go back to Judea. This is what I see, I guess, about the presence of the Lord, presence of Jesus in this particular portion of Scripture, is that Jesus isn't diminished. Jesus isn't diminished by the delay. His power, his presence, isn't diminished by the delay. In fact, it enlarges it. It actually makes it bigger. What we know is that now, we can't enlarge Jesus. Jesus is as big as he's going to get. He's God, and God doesn't get any bigger than God. God is God. God is as big as he's going to get. Nothing is bigger than God. But what I mean by that is that his glory, what we understand about God, is enlarged. We see more of him. His glory is enlarged as we... Um, uh, through the delays. The urgency of the moment would have compelled me to want to quickly run there, get there as fast as I could, uh, but not Jesus. That's because Jesus knew that the longer the delay, the greater the glory. The delay, uh, the delay meant decay, right? This is, they, the Jews didn't practice embalming, and so uh, oftentimes they, they would, the same day, put them in the tomb or put them in the grave so that they uh, they didn't decay uh, visibly in front of them. Um, and what do we fear? We fear that the longer things go, things will decay, right? Don't we fear that there's going to be decay in our relationship if we don't fix it right now? Are you like me, that when things are going south, you just want to immediately fix it? I guess that's more of a man thing. I mean, we want to, like, if the relationship's south or uh, a business deal is going south or something. We want to fix it right away. and uh, We don't want any time going by uh, because we're a little afraid that that decay is going to set in. Jesus wasn't afraid of the decay. and Why is that? Because Jesus can re uh, restore any decay. He can restore decay in a relationship. He can re uh, restore decay in a business deal. He can restore decay in a career. Uh, we're afraid that too much time has gone by and there's not going to be any hope for restoration. In verse 15, uh, 14 and 15, we'll skip ahead a little bit. It says that, uh, G so Jesus told them, or so, so then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So he uh, actually um, he hinted to the idea that Lazarus was dead. He called, uh, said that Lazarus was asleep. They didn't really get the idea, so he says it plainly. No, Lazarus is dead. Uh, and for your sake, he says, I'm glad. That's interesting. He says, for your sake, I'm glad. You know that word glad? It actually means rejoice. I, I rejoice. Uh, that's only used three times in the New Testament. Um, as it, I mean, attributed new, uh, three times to Jesus in the New Testament. And this is one of those times. He said, I'm glad that, that we're not there. I'm glad that uh, he's passed away. I'm glad that that he died. Why is that? He says, uh, I, uh, I'm glad I was not there, that you may believe. 
but let us go to him. Then Thomas, well, we'll stop there. What it, it says, um, it says that Jesus says, I'm glad that we weren't there for this reason, because now we know that there's decay is set in. Uh, he's been dead. He's going to be dead for four days by the time we get there. This would absolutely be a great miracle. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure um, how many of you might know this, but it, it, true as tradition at that time, uh, it was thought that a person's soul, it's probably not true, but this is what they believed, uh, a person's soul hovered around the body for two days, and then after that, the body uh, or the soul went on to be uh, to the afterlife. Um, so that probably isn't true, but that was their thinking. And so Jesus may have been referring to, this would give all that traditional thought uh, a chance to just be put to bed. And we're gonna get there, it's gonna be four days. Everybody's gonna know that his soul has departed and decay has really set in. Uh, when we actually get to the miracle, his sister's gonna say, Jesus, don't open the tomb. He's been in there four days. I mean, in other words, he's gonna smell, it's gonna be bad, it's gonna be a bad thing. Decay is gonna really be in full, you know, full swing there. Um, so here's what, I guess what, Jesus is saying he's saying rejoice because I'm going to intervene in this really bad situation and it's going to mean greater glory greater blessing we're just going to be patient and we're going to we're going to go as God gives us opportunity to go um, when I was a pharmaceutical rep uh, we had this this event this conference in Vegas Las Vegas and uh, I was excited to go because, you know, I don't get to go to Las Vegas very often. And so I was super excited about that opportunity. And um, usually at the beginning, they do some fun things and arrived uh, uh, in Las Vegas. And there were several from uh, of us from Fresno that were going. And um, we arrived there. I got to the hotels at the MGM Grand. <laughs> and um, you find out when you get there who your roommate is. Well, I got there and uh, I didn't have a roommate for whatever reason, and then they told me, well, uh, we actually don't have a room for you. So I waited and waited and waited, probably about an hour, hour and a half. Um, finally, they came to me and they said, yeah, we actually don't have a room for you. That was a little like, like, well, what am I gonna do? I thought I might wind up at some, you know, Motel 6 or whatever, I'm not sure what would happen. And, um, uh, they uh, they said, well, we don't have a room for you. We're going to send you across the street to New York, New York. It's a sister uh, hotel for us. And uh, so I went over there and they said, well, yeah, we don't have a room for you either. So I waited uh, longer uh, and they finally came to me. Uh, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes later and said, we, we have a room for you. Uh, it's actually uh, a suite. So they uh, I got in the elevator, went to the top. It was the top floor corner room. Uh, with windows overlooking the desert and overlooking the strip. It was an enormous room. It was so awesome. Uh, and here's a, what uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make is sometimes, for sure, if God allows delays, that he delays the, the awareness of his presence. The, if he delays the, the miracle that he has for us, he does that not to diminish us and not to diminish his glory and power, but to actually increase it. That's what he did with uh, this, this miracle with Lazarus. It actually increased the miracle and increased the glory of the Lord. Now let's read um, further. Verse eight it says, but Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews uh, there tried to stone you and yet you're going back. So um, in verse 10, if you recall, uh, the, the, what the, Pharisees and some of the leaders of the Jewish people were they had picked up stones and they were going to try and uh, stone Jesus <laughs> he calmed the whole situation but then they after that they wanted to arrest him and so this was fresh on the disciples minds and they say Jesus really you're going to go back to Judea where where people there are waiting to kill you they're waiting to arrest you verse 9 Jesus answered are there not 12 hours of daylight anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble for they see by this world's light it is when a person walks at night that they stumble for they have no light so jesus uses this uh interesting saying that 
hey, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna keep working as long as it's daylight and uh, know that, that we can see in the light of God's illumination. Verse 11, and after he had said this, he went, uh, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. And this is, they think he's actually talking about sleep because they respond. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, it will be better. So they're saying, you know, you know Jesus, just don't wake him up. We don't need to go back. If he sleeps, it'll be good for him. Um, Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. And then we've already read 14 and 15 where Jesus told them plainly that Lazarus was dead. So uh, what's interesting is Jesus, he knows that there's a real threat. I mean, there's a real threat in uh, Judea, in Bethany, where he's going to go to meet, meet uh, with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Uh, and then he tells him, hey, you know what, we're going to go, but I'm just letting you know that he's dead already which probably was even further confusing. Like, why would we put ourselves in harm's way uh, if Lazarus is already dead? What can we do about it now? Here's what I find about Jesus and his presence. That Jesus isn't deterred by the danger. Instead, Jesus' presence overcomes the danger. In John chapter 16, verse 33, it says, I have told you these things, so that in me you have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So Jesus, what he's doing is he's uh, saying later on in John, he says, you know, there, um, there are times when we go through uh, challenges and this life you're gonna have challenges, but know this, that Jesus has overcome it, that Jesus' presence overcomes the dangers that we face. In fact, um, in Psalms chapter 23, it's a familiar psalm to probably most of you, right? Some of you probably could quote it. But in that psalm, uh, David says this, you prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. What he's saying is, God, that in the, in the time where, where I'm most threatened, when the, the, there's danger all around me, you actually prepare a comfortable table. You supply all my needs that you, you are there in the midst of the danger that I face. See, danger doesn't deter God. Danger doesn't deter God's presence. In fact, I believe that oftentimes in danger, God shows up more profoundly inside of us if we lean on him. Now, a lot of times what we wanna do is we wanna hide in danger. When there's danger out there, let's, let's shelter in place. Let's, you know, let's, let's get, you know, get away from the danger. And I certainly wouldn't say that we should be reckless in our life. But Jesus uh, doesn't want us to live in fear or to fear not because God is with us. We need to trust him to show up in the midst of our difficulty and in our fear. What's interesting in uh, verse 16, Thomas says uh, something pretty cool. Actually, it seems, uh, uh, it seems like pessimistic and it is because Thomas is the, the ultimate pessimist. Uh, Thomas says, Verse 16, it says, <laughs> then Thomas, also known as Didymus, that word Didymus means uh, twin, so he was uh, likely a twin, which I, that, just a little side note. If he was a twin, Jesus didn't call his twin brother, he only called Thomas to be one of his disciples. And you know what's so common among twins is they're polar opposites. They have some similarity, but in a lot of ways, they're very different from one another. So it's possible that, that Thomas's brother was very optimistic and very upbeat. He would not have been the pessimist at all. That gives us hope for all of us pessimists out there. It gives us hope that God's presence is still there with us. That God wants to use us in spite of the fact that we maybe see things on the more gloomy side of, of life. It says, uh, then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Let's go so that we can die with Jesus. Uh, and it almost sounds kind of gloomy and doomy and you know all that but i think what he's saying is this he's saying the danger is real the danger is powerful and the danger is real but i would rather be with jesus in danger i'd rather be with jesus facing death than not to be with him at all it's actually i think it's a great statement of of thomas wanting to be in the presence of the lord he's willing to face danger to be with Jesus than to be safe and comfortable without Jesus. And that's ultimately where 
we need to be with Jesus. Is he wants to and desires and is available to us all the time. Lo, I'm with you, even to the very ends of the age. He always is there with us. No danger uh, dissuades him, and delay doesn't you know doesn't deter his presence. He is there for us. He is with us. I would encourage you, be hopeful today. Know that Jesus is there for you. He's with you. His presence is always there and available to you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day in the Lord.